welcome to my gray room in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I do my processing and printing and so forth. And today we're going to talk about color, light, action, and pattern, and also gesture and how the synchronicity work together, the gestalt of it all to make a great image. Light in an image, you have the possibility of action, whether it be large in your face or just um, subtle, and you have the possibility of a pattern or composition. And then I uh, treat gesture outside of that. And I'm going to talk about all five of these. I think gestures are really important and I think they need to be complete. This image is predominantly about color. It's also about the way I composed it. This image, actually predominantly about light. Light and color, of course, color evolves from light, so sometimes it's hard to separate the two. This is large, in-your-face action, and action action trumps. Pulls to prize, you know, that's how you win a pulls to prize is great action. But action can also be subtle and very, very small. And pattern. Where are you place things or is there a pattern um, inherent within the image? And when I talk about gesture, I'm talking about it literally, that it needs to be complete. It need, at the peak moment, someone's saying hello or, or strumming a guitar, you want that peak moment, no matter how small and no matter how many are in your image, they all need to be complete. And sometimes I find many of my images are predominantly about gestures. So this is what I mean. This image, of course, color and light. They, they do merge together. Of course, my compositions are always very critical to me. I, I really work on them impeccably. And I'm the type of photographer that I frame everything within my screen. I don't crop very much anything just crust off, off the bread, so to speak because I started with transparencies as a magazine photographer. I like getting it right within the camera. This is action uh, and pattern, slow action. And of course, the gestures, looking down, looking at the foot, pattern and color, very strong, powerful color. Pattern, and again, you could say, well, this is about light or color, They're kind of both the same thing, but you know, predominantly pattern. Color and action, pattern, and color, I don't remove wires. If there's wires, I'm gonna figure out a way to leave them in. Pattern and light, or you could say a color also. Light and action, I think wildlife, you better have some peak moments in there. Color and very strong in your face action, India, holy. Pattern and color, right? And again, action and color. So you can see when I I started editing and I'm self-taught, which is not necessarily a great thing because the teacher doesn't know anything. I would look at my images and go, you know, well, well, what is it about? What is it about? And I think travel photography is one of the hardest fields because uh, I have great subjects. I'm blessed with great subjects. So my job as a photographer is to make a great image, to interpret that. How do I feel? I want that in, in, embedded in my images. I want them to be solely mine, something that I can say is my own. And these four elements plus the gestures are critical. So first let's talk about color. And again, I am just, just going across the very tippy top of the iceberg in all these topics. And I don't think most photographers understand the importance of color and its role in not only conveying mood and emotion, but in basic composition. Color communicates. Color transmits information. It links us with an unspoken language. It also links us with our own language, which, of course, is different uh, among different cultures. And we're born with limited color vision. We develop it over the first three months. One in 12 men actually are colorblind and one in 200 females. We're trichromatic, but you know, it's interesting. Women are more sensitive to color and one to 2% of women are tetrachromatic. There's an extra comb between the red and the green. You need two X chromosomes. You actually need a DNA, um, you know, a, a, a test of C if, if this is yours, but it boasts your color from 10 million to 100 million different shades. Butterflies are pentachromatic and uh, 
uh, I'd love to, and plus they can also see ultraviolet and infrared. So, you know, I want to talk just a, a few important examples of what I call the many contrasts of colors. Uh, uh, Johannes Etern, who was a painter and designer, he was the first one to make a theory about the possible types of contrasts that are produced by the different features of color. And if you're a painter, you understand color better than most. And a lot of times people say to me, should I go to a photography school? I say, you know, I think you should go to art school and learn color because observing the effects colors have on each other is a starting point for understanding the relativity of color, the relationships of values of saturations and warmth and coolness. So let's first talk about the contrast of light and dark. It's, it's the simplest of all the contrast to understand. And I'll elaborate on this when I talk about light. So the juxtapositions of these two colors with different brightness or tonal values are make it very, very strong. Now, the contrast of saturation, when it's 100% of color saturation produces a very high visual contrast. These colors do not have any other colors in them. You know, they're just the actual, the color itself. And in low contrast, it is easier definitely to see colors, these strong colors. Now, these are really important for photographers, the contrast of complementary colors. We perceive those as high contrast colors, right? And they're very strong. It's no mystery that emergency and buoys and things that want to be noticed are contrasting colors. Uh, when you put blue and yellow together, they intensify each other. You know, they actually vibrate on the edge. A simple image, like these fishermen coming out of a door in Iceland, it's about the orange and the, the colors itself. Bangladesh national flag is green and uh, red. Very, very strong. They, it turns up the volume. There's no question about it. And so when I am very aware, when I see these strong colors next to each other, and then in addition, which is kind of part of what I was just talking about, the contrast of advancing, which is warm and receding colors, also across from each other, cool, cool colors in general will recede, where warm colors will appear to advance, okay? And they're on the opposite side of the color spectrum because as their visual wavelengths are uh, comparisonly long, red emits the longest visual wavelength of all. Vincent van Gogh, he was um, a big proponent of this, and you can see this in many of, of his images. So when you put blues and, and reds next to each other, very different than, than the green ones, especially if they're cool. Blues are wonderful for backgrounds. That's why using the sky is so fantastic for an image. And again, they just, you know, there's this combination of receding, plus we've got these complementary colors. So very, very powerful. Now, harmonizing or analogous colors are the colors that are next to each other. And the, the great uh, Galen Rao landscape photographer, he brought this to my attention. He was a brilliant writer and he talked about how he would see uh, land, you know, different greens and, and blues in his landscape images. But when he would look at them, you know, in his film, they tended to merge into each other. And that is often what happens. But that can be an absolute benefit because it's softer. You know, there's a, it's not that strong, you know, screaming feeling that you get with the um, complementary colors. Monet, they were, he was a frequent user of complementary colors and also Degas. And so I'm aware of them. And I, I think the, when you can, when you study your images at home and, and to ask yourself, what do you like about your image? What don't you like about your image? Did you get everything in the frame that you wanted to? Does it have a feeling? And then think about the colors. Is it because of the colors? Sometimes I see that like on Facebook, people will say, hey, do you like the color picture or the black and white picture? And I go, well, that's, they're asking that. That means I don't think they were thinking about their colors particularly well, or they may not, you may not understand color well enough. So please study that. And when I get these analogous colors, 
with this pop, this punctuation of red, very, very strong. That is um, a beauty for me. Uh, John Paul Campernegro, uh, who I think is a brilliant writer also, he, go to his website. He has some wonderful little tutorials about, about color. So yellow is one of the strongest colors. It's brilliant. It's resolute. It's, it's an advancing color. It's the very first wavelength of light seen by all of us. And of course, you know, colors have different meanings in different languages. You know, we have words for, you know, yellow for coward, but that might not be true in other, other cultures. In Japan, it's the color of courage. In Egypt, it's the color of mourning. It's sadness in Greece. It's jealousy in France. In China, it's very prestigious. Orange is an energetic, fun color. It's, it's a divisive color. It's not my favorite color, but Frank Sinatra thought it was orange is the happiest color. I don't know. Interestingly, orange does not have a single English word that rhymes with it. Blue, my favorite color, is the world's most popular color. Perhaps our familiarity with the sky. It's restful. It's definitely receding. And it's just, again, I get low and use skies quite often. Um, green is also not a primary color, but primary use. It's young. It's a, also a receding color, really good for backgrounds. It has contradictory meanings in, in our, the English language, uh, but it unites us with nature and fertility. Purple is generally a receding color, but actually it depends on its hue. And it's associated with royalty because it was such a difficult um, color to um, to harvest, particularly in, in the early Phoenician and um, Byzantine eras. And it's, it's not a very popular color for food. Now, white is the sum of all colors. If, you, if you're spinning the color wheel fast enough, you get white. It's an advancing color. It's hope. It's new beginning. It's clarity. It's hard to get a pure white because um, inevitably, like another color that's next to it is going to merge into it. Now, black is a color that doesn't exist in pure form, except in our imaginations. There's no such thing as a perfect black. It's a very difficult photograph for me to find because <laughs> there wouldn't be much detail in it. It's the most recessive color. I also personally think wearing just black is a shame that you should put some, some beautiful bright color on top of your black. All right. And it's Black absorbs about 90% of the light. And I love this quote. I do not literally paint that table, but the emotion it produces upon me. And color does produce emo uh, emotion. And um, it's just beautiful. Now, light's easier to talk about because most of us see light in, in the same way. You know, let's talk about the personality of light the intensity of light. When I'm looking at light, you know, all, I travel a lot. I was uh, oh, in Sri Lanka recently, and then I was in India. I just came back from Mexico, and I'm also off to Japan next week. And the quality of light is different in all these different countries. So this is India, and this is, could you know, uh, also the light in Santa Fe, very, very strong. The direction of the light, I don't, when I evaluate light, I'm also always evaluating the shadows, which is very, very critical. We tend, of course, our eyes attracted to the lightest thing in any image. That's why what you have in the light in your image should be what you want and should be very important. But the shadows are, are critical. And here's direct light. It's the light that I think most of us were taught, like this is what you want to use, the sun's in back of you, and the direct light. But it it can create some really harsh shadows if you're not careful. Love side lighting coming in from the side, especially highlighting it when there's dust or smoke, in this case, um, in an image. Backlighting. I love it. And you have to be a little careful not to get a flare. You, you can use a hood or I take my hand and, you know, I can see where the flare is going to be and I can shade it myself. But I love backlighting. Diffuse lighting, I think, is the easiest to photograph in, and it's uh, it's it actually brings out color. Um, as I was saying, you know, low, low contrast light actually brings it's easier to see the colors, and it's one that I think is the easiest for any of us to photograph in. But also atmospheric conditions, and it's so important to not just photograph in the sun, but photograph in the snow and the rain, and because that's where you get 
different images. That's where you get the ones that you go, wow, that's a literally a snowflake image. One that is, is unique and special and your own, nobody else has it. The temperature, transmitted uh, warm light versus uh, diffused cool. Night light, I'm not the best um, nighttime photographer, I must admit, but I occasionally get out there and photograph. But I do love photographing in artificial light, particularly traveling. Most places look better in artificial light, I can tell you, at, at night. It masks out problems, and um, also it intensifies the color. So when I think about light, I just think about the consistency. Is it flowing all the way across? Because even in low contrast light, like here, it's not always even. And I'm evaluating the shadows. And depending on the altitude, I live at 7,000 feet. So my shadows are, they're, they're intense. And I often go up to much higher. Low altitude, you have more detail in your shadows. And speaking of shadows, the edges of shadows, so you have really sharp um, edges in uh, your shadow, they better be important to your image. It's, you can get by with feathered, you know, that's why low, con uh, you know, late evening light is often more feathered and not as sharp as the middle of the day. Uh, chiaroscuro is a cinemagraphic term. It's, it's about the contrast between light and dark, and it's mostly reserved for strong contrast like this one. But you can see high contrast makes it harder to see the color. And it also can become very confusing. The eyeball here is what is holding us, the humanity of this image, it, of the light playing on a, a, a screen in of a window. Spectral highlights. I don't use the blinkies in my cameras because um, I don't want them to mask spectral highlights. Uh, and sometimes you can really mess up your exposure that way because light bulbs, headlights, reflections in water, they're there. They, you will not ever be able to get detail in them unless you paste or clone or something like that because it'll just turn gray. There's just no detail. Fundamentally, we want the drama of light. We want drama, maybe not this much drama, but we do want drama. I'm not gonna talk much about the perfect light because as far as I'm concerned, anybody can photograph in the perfect light and most anything can be photographed in the perfect light. Although there's no such thing as a boring subject, I don't think. That's why backyard photography is very good for you you know, to learn because there's just very boring ways of photographing things. And I find in the perfect light that a lot of times people just go, oh, that's pretty, click. And that's the problem with travel photography. People go, oh, interesting subject, click. Oh, interesting landscape because everything's so new and fresh and wonderful. But you have to channel your inner artist and go, okay, this is beautiful light. Now, how can I get that one more thing, that special thing here? You know, here for me, it was getting the edge of the sun refraction. And boy, I waited for that bird at the Taj Mahal. I waited. And here the light was beautiful, but I saw the shadows of the Buddhist stupas. And then luckily this monk was walking and I waited right until he was in the sun and watching his feet, of course. Again, beautiful light, but I'm going, how can I make this different? How can I make this special? And everything has to matter in an image. You eliminate everything that doesn't matter. And the, the more that you photograph within your viewfinder and try to get it right and learn how to move, um, you're going to become a better photographer. But as a travel photographer, I have to work in really bad light a lot, okay? And one of the biggest things you have to understand is the way we see contrast with our eyes, we see detail outside in highlights and in the deep shadows. Well, film was, the slide film was one of the worst. It had a very, very shallow dynamic range. And these days you get what you pay for with your cameras. There's definitely more dynamic range. And of course you can sandwich images or use HDR. Um, and the iPhone of course has a, you know, built in um, HDR. So, but the reality is that this can be a, a, a creative um, advantage. So when I look at an image, I started out as a darkroom photographer and black and white. I'm really glad I did because I, I tend to look at the, when I'm thinking about an image, I see what I call the skeleton of light, the light in the dark. Okay. Not the, with a veneer of color, 
Does the color work? And I'm doing this, of course, very quickly in my mind, but I want to see the structure of the light because I can see outside that window. I can see the huts. I can see the grass and everything, but I know it's not going to show up on this image. And I like working with that. Color is seductive. Sometimes it can mask the structure of your image. So this is what I mean. I tend to see the structure in black and white. And then I think about the color on top of it. And does it work? Because high contrast light, you're uh, it's okay in person because there's other senses. You're walking through the woods, you smell things, you're, the breeze is on your skin, you're talking to someone you like. But as a photographer, I evaluate the light and I go, whoa, on a two-dimensional, my eye, there's no way my eye can flow across that light. Very contrasty. So I get in closer, still really contrasty. And remember, whatever is lightest in the image is you know, what you're attracted to. So this is an image about some dirty fingernails and a lot of orange. I got closer. This is better. But the light is still not in the eyes. It's still highlighting parts of the image that I don't really want. So I move on to another subject. I'm almost there. I've got the light in the eye. But the last thing I do before I finish my image is I run my eye all the way around the frame and I fix my experience my um, ratio of my exposure so there's more depth of field so I don't have this out of focus blob of orange and now I have an image that works so sometimes you have to delve in see something you like and then you go okay I'm an artist see photographically see how the color is going to work see how the light is going to work and so sometimes you create an image because of the contrast, not despite it, not with awkward shadows on someone's face, but because the shadows and light are playing together as geometry, you know, and of course, silhouettes work very well with that, but you see it as an image that works because of the contrast and even in beautiful light, especially in beautiful light, you're going to have some very, very strong uh, contrasts. So here's some tips for photographing in difficult light. First of all, if you like, really like someone, like I did with this young boy, put him in the shade. This is for a geographic article I did on the Blue Nile. Middle of the day, moved him right into the shade, all right? And, and if I'm walking down the streets, like the streets of Morocco, one side is sunny, they're narrow, and the other side's in the shade. I'm going to photograph on the side where it's shady. I don't... It, it, it has to work as a contrasty image on the right-hand side, not just because I like that butcher over there in his shop. If the shadows aren't working for me, I'm going to go and stay in the shady side. And I'll move people inside. I'll use the edge of light and shadow, like a, a window. And that, of course, makes that beautiful side lighting very, very strong. So Pay attention to problems. I feel like I'm a problem solver. When I see something I like, one of the first things that goes through my head, you know, I'm looking at the structure, like I said, with the color, but I'm going, what's the problem? And so I see this amazing, um, actually, it's a kitchen in Bhutan, and the light is fantastic coming through, but there's this big window in the back, and that's the problem, but there's some kids there. Nobody else is in there, so I brought my guide in. And then, and had him stand there. I did use a little flash here. But then the, the um, oh, homeowners came in. And I like natural images. I, I'm a photojournalist at heart. I don't like to do setups that much, um, except for maybe some portraits. So I'm watching this. But, you know, this is, uh, everything has to work in an image. And it's, it's almost there. This is getting better. But the guy on the right, oh, in that window, which is a problem, the kid is there. So I'm going, come in, come in, come in. So finally, the kid comes all the way through the window. And now the choreography of both people come together. So I'm just looking at the scene. A lot of it is, you know, of course, it's luck and being graced with moments. But you have to be there. to be, And do you have to be patient and also to recognize what the problems are. Like when I, this amazing woman um, from China, the uh, Longhorn Meow, and I'm following her, but I'm keeping her right in that, that V of white light because white light in the background can be a huge problem. 
And then it rains and it's really easy to just go, oh no, but that's when I start to get excited, these atmospheric conditions. So I have umbrellas with me. I was just recently in Sri Lanka with some friends and we sat for hours in the pouring rain with our ponchos and our cameras and just fantastic images that you, the type of images that you don't get otherwise, but you have to be willing to overcome the inertia. I think photography is a lot about your own personal psychology and there's a difference between being sick and being lazy. And also you got to know when sometimes you're just missing out on some great opportunities because you don't want to get a little cold or you don't want to get a little wet. And I landscape photography. If you talk to the really great landscape photographers, they're going out in the ring. They're going out in difficult um, conditions because it's just, much more um, exciting. And then right after the rains here in Cusco, I was just thrilled because I knew there'd be amazing puddles. So I went running out, the rain stopped, and I'm just hovering over this beautiful, huge puddle uh, in the the middle of, of Cusco. And then it snows. And I don't like cold weather all that much, but I've spent a lot of time in it. But again, I know this is when I've got to get out of my sleeping bag. I'm camping in Bhutan and I'm, it's dark and it's cold. And this is where it's a lot about psychology. You know, you want the great pictures. You got, you've got to put yourself out there. And I made myself go out and I bless these cameras with the, the ability to do the high ISO images I could never make with film. And then the light, it's dark. And that's also when people stop. And that's when I start to get excited because I also know that some of the best images come during that twilight period because, you know, colors again, really start to pop out in this low light. And there's a, depending on your latitude, of course, really depends on your latitude, but you know, those of us, most people live close enough to the equator or thereabouts. Not, I'm not talking about Alaska or Antarctica or places like that. Uh, Iceland, But about where I live in Santa Fe, about 15 to 20 minutes uh, after sunset, there's a very awkward light. It's like "Mm, the sky's a little too light. The artificial lights haven't come on. But about 15 to 20 minutes afterwards, that's when you get this great juxtaposition of blue skies and and this um, artificial light. And of course, it's not, it doesn't matter whether it's cloudy or um, clear for blue skies. And sometimes during rainstorms, like just happened, this is in Williams in Arizona, the sky just turned this amazing purple. And this was about, I would say about 30 minutes or so after the sun had gone down. And uh, it's just one of my favorite times to get to, to use artificial and natural light all together. And then the sky goes black. And when the sky goes black, that's when I just go for the artificial light and not worry about the sky that much. But I will tell you this because I'm hand-holding most everything I do. And this is how I do it. I get really steady. I get my elbows into my side. I take a deep breath. I let it out. And I have my camera on continuous. I make at least five frames because if you're just clicking like this, you're moving your camera. So if you do continuous, you're squeezing and then you're pressuring in the middle. That's the most stable. And then you're lifting your finger off. And this is how I photograph a lot in low light at, you know, especially with, you know, my um, Canon, this R5 is, is a very big sensor for, you know, 40 megapixels. So the bigger the sensor, the more obvious your camera motion is going to be. So I have to be very steady. And I'll, here I'm holding myself up against a wall, again, on continuous. I just need one image that works. And with each camera I have, there's, there's a limit to what ISA I go to. You know, cameras are more and more working better and better with noise reduction. And of course there's better and better plugins like Topaz for noise reduction. But nevertheless, I still have a a top end for every uh, camera and action, you know? Oh, Brenda, um, before I go into action, are, are there any questions? I think everybody's just enraptured like I am with what you're saying. So Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll then we'll we'll save them. Keep um, going, girl. Keep going. Okay. Well, great. Let's talk about action because I like fast moving situations. Okay. Um, I uh, I I see something. A lot of a lot of action is anticipating, and when I see some, you know, you want to be in the right spot. I'm 
really pretty good about, you know, uh, uh, anticipating where something's going to happen and trying to get myself there as fast as possible. I remember running. I saw this guy in Mongolia getting ready. Um, you know, this was not a festival. It was just an everyday kind of occurrence. And, and I was like running over because again, I wanted to fill the frame uh, with this image. So action is gesture on steroids, especially this is the uh, one of the it also in Mongolia and Ulaanbaatar for the uh, the Genghis Khan anniversary, 200 anniversary, and this big extravaganza. And so when when um, action's coming towards you, you can get away with a little bit slower of a shutter speed. You know, this they're moving pretty fast. So I have 640 uh, here, but when they're when you're photographing from the side, that's when you really need to um, up your shutter speed. And I, I did in this case as, as they passed me by. And again, look at the atmospheric conditions. Just love the, the dust and the way it pops the color. I'm just going to keep bringing out color. Of, of course, monks are fantastic because red is one of our one of the most advancing colors and it's just perfect and it works against a white sky it works of course against a neutral stairway and here again i'm looking set trying separation of all my different subjects right but here i they're running so i'm at five hundredth of a second i will say that i i work because i come from the world of journalism i work I work primarily in shutter priority because I'm thinking about um, holding my camera still because I don't use a tripod very often. When you need it, you need it, but I don't need it all that often or I don't have it with me. And I also like slow shutter speeds, as I'm going to talk about, and, um, you know, things like that. So I and I have to switch to a high shutter speed. So, of course, I pay attention to my aperture. Most nature photographers work in aperture priority, but um, for myself, shutter priority works the best. I'm not saying that you should change the way you photograph, because I think however you are the fastest, most accurate and the most most important, the most creative is is what really really matters but sometimes you know being able to be versatile in aperture priority because i i also work in infrared photography and on infrared i do work in aperture priority because i don't want to go above um f uh, f8 because of some problems with the equipment you can get hot spots that's all Whole another subject. But when I get multiple subjects here, I've, oh, you know, again, faster shutter speed. And I make a lot of images because all I need is one. I don't just go click. I usually stay on continuous low, uh, occasionally on continuous high, depending on what I'm doing. Um, but most of the time it's continuous low. And here at the, this is actually New Mexico. This is the big hole in uh, the, the blue hole, big, big blue hole. This very, very deep. Um, like a whole cave system and kids come and jump. So I it was lucky I got them all jump off at the same time. Pretty fast shutter speed here, um, one thousandth of a second. And this is a tough one. Uh, I was just recently in Mongolia and trying to get that arrow as it releases. Mostly it's no, 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 miss, miss, miss. But you just keep trying, trying, trying. And uh, sometimes you get lucky, but I got to have a really fast shutter speed for that one. Okay. And wildlife, I'm always prepared to be at a fast shutter speed. I try to keep an ISO that's going to work for a lot of different combinations of um, f-stops and shutter speed. I mean, I love my iPhone because whatever camera you have with you is the best. But I, one of the creative foundations of working with you know the bigger cameras are are being able to work very quickly between these slow shutter speeds and fast shutter speeds and of course selective focus and i love slow shutter speeds i didn't understand them at first this is a film image i actually am on a tripod i don't know what my shutter speed was but when i looked at it on my light table i went whoa that's not a curtain that's a person and they're starting to ghost out i want to incorporate that so when you look at your images, find out things. I just made all these. I just tried. I experimented. And then when, when there was something I liked, I tried to figure it out so that then I could become conscious about using that in my photography. Now, we're used to slow shutter speed um, in nature, water in particular. And I am on a tripod here in Iceland. It's, it's irresistible. But I also use it in other situations in my travel. 
And sometimes it's difficult, especially when it's very light out. You'll notice I'm down to my lowest ISO for this camera and I'm at my most, you know, closed down aperture of F22. And that left me with 10th of a second. And because I'm in raw, I can get away with a little lighter image. But I want that. Again, photography is about feeling. It's not just here are people at the beach. It's like, wow, it's just dreamy. And, and this is backlit. Um, and I usually like one thing sharp in an image, but sometimes apparent sharpness is good enough. And I wanted the feeling I was in Tibet and the pilgrims are going around, you know, in the Jokan and they're prostrating. I wanted the feeling of the rushing of the crowd, but the stillness of the prostrator. And it took me quite a long time because people would walk in front of the camera and just trying to get it just right. And 10th of a second worked very well for me here. And finally, like I said, all I need is one to make my point. And I didn't have my tripod at this festival. So I used my camera bag on a railing to damper vibrations. And again, ISO 100, F22, and I was able to get to one second and the mountain was staying still and, um, and most of the crowd. So I love slow shutter speeds. They give you that feeling. And I love flash. This is another reason why, um, uh, working with my camera is so important because my camera, my flash is on my camera. I, I, I don't work with off camera flash because I need both of my hands to hold my camera and, and move the lens to what I want. Um, so I have different tricks and that's again, a whole nother topic, but you know, this is something if you're interested in, because what happens is because a flash is about one eight hundredth of a second, I can use these slow shutter speeds and then I get this brilliance of sharpness within an image. So I'm at a festival in um, uh, Sri Lanka up in the north in Jaffna area. And um, this is a uh, 40th of a second. And I, and not only is the flash stopping the action, it pops color. It gives that luminosity. And I use flash for so many reasons. But it's the reason why the people in, that are closest to me, that are, of course, at 40th of a second, would be total blur if I didn't have the flash. And this is what I wanted for a festival in Colombia. Um, 13th of a second, you know, I usually work... I would say start out between a 10th and 15th of a second with this um, idea. When you work at the, you get lower shutter speeds, working with flash, it gets, it's harder, but some of your results can be absolutely fantastic. And you'll notice in my settings, I say probably EV of minus 1.3. That's because it drives me crazy. Lightroom just says, Flash fire, flash doesn't fire. But um, my baseline for thinking about flash is minus 1.7. And I'm usually in the minus area because I'm relatively close. And um, and so I usually down there, but here it's sunlight. So minus, I'm guessing minus one, something like that. And I just want that first woman to be sharp. Now look at this, this is handheld at a third of a second tack sharp. And you can see the dark line around the man. Of course, it's not a shadow. He's next to the air, but it's how much he moved. Now that camel was stalwart. He didn't move very much or she, but, um, and the flash was probably minus two, not very much. And I do use gels on my flash. Very important. A gel and a dome diffuser. Panning, when you follow motion at the exact same speed. And my baseline for thinking about panning is 15th of a second. And it's great for eliminating distracting elements in the background, contrasting light, um, and again, feeling. It's about, about feeling. This is in a market in Bangladesh, and these, these guys were rushing by with their, with their catch of the, of the day. And I'm just standing off to the side out of everybody's way uh, because it was dim, a tenth of a second. Um, uh, could be at a low ISO because, you know, it, it worked, there was enough light, but I have to follow exactly. And so if, without flash, it can work, but panning with flash gives you that extra insurance. Plus, if you go to, the problem is if you're using really fast subjects, like these ladies were dancing very, very fast. Without the flash, I think their legs would have ghosted out because the legs, of course, are moving faster than the torsos. So that really, you know, pops the color 
and eliminates a bad background and, uh, you know, gives me uh, feet. But again, it's, it's exuberance. That's how I felt about these young boys who were just horsing around. Tenth of a second, that's, again, a very comfortable one. You get into 30th of a second, unless you're at the Indy 500, um, it's, it's an in-between mode between fast shutter speed and slow shutter speed. So I would say 10th of a second, 15th of a second. But, you know, I was in Cuba and um, I photographed quite a bit there and I'm going, okay, what else can I do? Make your insurance images. The one, because the image that you think of first is probably the one you know how to do and you probably will succeed at. But you want to keep, you want to keep expanding your creative muscles and growing. So try things that you go, I don't know if this is going to work because that's how I learned. I didn't know if anything was going to work. And then the most miraculous things might happen or mostly they don't. Mostly they're just like, no, no, no. But then here I was, I was doing a lot of frames. This is eighth of a second. He's moving fast as you can see. And um, I'm also topping, I can't get much slower than eighth of a second because I'm an F22. And with the camera I was using, I think 800 was as, as high as I wanted to go on my ISO, which is different now. But look how sharp that boxer is. And look at the color. I mean, this beautiful sharpness with the color. And this is what I love. But when I talk about action, we really are talking about the, the moment and the gesture uh, of the moment. Now, I'm not a great wildlife photographer. If I could train birds. That would be like fantastic. But I'm always looking for them in my pictures. I really am because they add that, that surprise and exuberance to an image that can just, you know, add that wow factor. Gestures matter. You know, that again, that peak moment, lighting the match, pouring, you know, and um, just realizing, you know, filling the frame completely with what you want. Images that evoke a feeling are special. If you can say like happiness or exuberance or like this is very funny. If, and if someone asked me if I set this up, I went, no, if I was going to set it up, I would have put that one of those blue, blue ponchos is pink, but um, it was just a moment that was just too funny. And if you can make people laugh, that's great. And I like working with multiple subjects, but all the gestures have to work. All the moments have to work, you know, and moments are primarily about gestures and um, the tail swinging, the man looking down at the time, the, the, the two little dogs, hairless dogs in their little pink coats and notice the color. Notice how the pink is flowing. The pink is going from the dogs to the man's shirts. And, you know, if your eye can flow across an image, that's what you want. You want it to flow across the color. You want it to flow across the light. The action needs to be understandable. And, um, you know, again, your composition, it's really all about it all flowing together. So this last little subject, which is um, really also important, and I'm not just talking about like stacks of shoes, uh, uh, the pattern of an image. Um, so this, um, I showed you this one before, and to me, it was all about the pattern. It was about the color and the pattern. And this, notice this, this is primarily about triangles, the elbows, the way, the, uh, color and um, pattern here, the triangles of the girls up above, the lady on the right-hand side, she's also looking to the right. And it was the lady on the left, when she got distracted, instead of looking at me, which was okay, but it was better when suddenly she got distracted and looked over to her right-hand side. And that made all the difference in, um, in the world because this is about geometry. And what that means is eliminate everything that doesn't matter. One of the reasons that this image is so tight on the left-hand side, as you can see at the very top, there's a little white piece. Um, that's because the, the building ended. So I was just using space on the right-hand side, or this could be turned into a square, but everything that doesn't matter. So I was driving by the road, up in the Jaffna area and in Sri Lanka. And these girls were 
they were getting ready to do this dance for this videographer. <laughs> we just sort of went, ah, that's so beautiful. But there were so many problems. Remember, there was like all this blank space behind them and wires and the building didn't work. So I was, I tried from this angle because the biggest thing you can do to improve your photography is to move. And then the one on the right-hand side's not bad. Um, but then I found this triangle where I realized I could get both of the girls, you know, front and back and have my little Kali, she's, she's imitating a um, Hindu god, Kali, the destroyer, and, you know, put her arms up and she was totally into her, um, her, her Kali-ness and her goddessness. And it, it's, it's eliminating um, everything that doesn't matter and keeping only that matters and really paying attention to the geometry of a situation, even static situations. And again, anytime you can do that, one more thing, not, not just the photograph of a dome, but here's the, um, a juxtaposition, you know, using light, using shadows, um, making your image all about, uh, all about pattern. And centeritis is a dreaded disease. I had it, you know, uh, putting people in the middle of the picture is something I don't do, except I did early on. And you can see in the middle picture, verticals, te people tend to put people in the middle of a picture. And, and then there's like nothing around them like that. But luckily, I um, this was film. And I all of a sudden went, wait a minute, what, what am I photographing? What am I photographing? What do I care about in this image? And I realized that um, uh, I wanted I wanted to get closer. And I just wanted to photograph actually closer. So that one didn't really work very well. But I love the power of verticals. Um, I'm actually more of a horizontal photographer. But when I see something that works as a vertical, I think it's very, very powerful. And the aesthetics of squares. Um, I have Hasselblad envy. So in my Olympus, uh, which I'm using, I've gone back and forth between Canon and Olympus and I've used Sony and lots of different cameras. It's not about the camera, but I did like the Olympus because I could just push a button and I would see a square framing. Now I have a grid screen in my camera that shows me squares because I really, really love squares. I, I kind of usually use the original crop of my frame, whether it's four thirds or two thirds, and then I will go to a square if I want to. But I'm usually have, have pre-thought this as a square. So, you know, optical perspective is one thing, but physical perspective, move, get low. Most of us photograph straight on with our knees bent a little bit. Get low. Someone's low. Get, get low. Get right down in there. Don't, try not to get run over, but get low, get powerful. Here I'm kneeling on the sand using a wide angle lens, which is exaggerating whatever's closest to me. Had to wait a bit for the birds to come back. And horizons, don't, the horizons in the middle of the picture are deadly. I'm low here because I need to get that horizon down. I'm constantly looking at that. What is the problem? There's usually at least one problem. Sometimes it's a water bottle. Sometimes it's a white t-shirt. Sometimes there's always a white car. There's always a white car in your picture. And here it was the horizon. But if I got low, um, then I could see these poor camels. They were so hot. They're molting, you know, where they're going, bring me the winner and try higher. You know, um, that's why I love mirrorless cameras. I love being able to get low with a flip out screen or higher, um, or work on a bridge. And here I'm holding it higher so I can look down on the beautiful Cuban tile floor. Selective focus. Um, I'm, I'm just bringing out the things that are going to make you see photographically, make you a more interesting photographer using this color, light, action, and pattern. And the ability to use the shallow depth of field is so wonderful. And again, just need the eyes and focus of lovely Maria, six-year-old Maria, who is a chess genius already. I don't mind things being out of focus in my image. We, especially Westerners, we're very literal. We were brought up with, you know, F8 and B there, close, middle, far. But, you know, the beauty of selective focus and bokeh. And here I just focused, I didn't have to focus. I focused any place except for on the horse because it was snowing so dramatically in, in Iceland. And that's what I wanted, that feeling. And that's why I encourage people to think in terms of layers because a camera is a cyclops. You know, we have to put depth into our images. Okay. So, um, and uh, again, it's a challenge. It's hard. I mean, I think it's best to start out trying to get, you know, one subject 
impeccably in your frame and understand color and how all these elements are working together, but then move on, go, I want one more element. I want the the horses framing, you know, the, the, in, in Mexico, these wonderful, wonderful horsemen and women. And, and again, each one of them are separate. Everything has to matter in the image. The guy in front at, at the golden temple in Amritsar in India, that could be a photograph in itself. The guy in the back reading the, uh, the Quran, his book, um, that could be a picture in itself. And then there's always a background. So when I talk about layers, it's one and two and the background. So here I've got one, two, three, four, and they're all, every gesture is mattering. And of course, they're all separated and clear. And I first have attracted in this, um, oh, Myanmar. Oh, I, I miss Myanmar. I feel so sorry. The world, we're just a wicked place right now. And so I was attracted to the father and son and then the ladies in the back and then the lady way in the back. It was like one more thing. They all had to be separated and they all had to have significance. You know, every gesture, you know, including the mirror here, you know, working. And so, yeah, this is a little harder, but these are the images that I really love is when I see groups of people um, and it's, you know, things are moving fast. The color is important. I had to move around because the contrasty light was a killer. And I realized I needed that blue sky, red, blue, yellow. I've got my primary strong colors. I'm kneeling on a beach here, like moving my these little inches at a time because I have to keep the separations between, you know, the, these, the, all the fishermen and the ropes and the things like that. And the bird, of course, was a gift. And think about space. You know, the great Robert Kappa, he said, well, if your photographs aren't powerful enough, you're probably not close enough. I think that's true because I think what he really means is eliminate everything that doesn't matter. Keep only what matters. But sometimes space adds dimension um, to your image. And um, so uh, sometimes let your images breathe. Don't always go in tight. That's why I'm always careful about people cropping because sometimes they just sort of start, you know, chopping off, you know, the parts of the image that are actually really quite wonderful. And here we've got a beautiful like two Z, two monks, two trees, two pagodas, um, a symmetry and also space. So most important, coming to the end here, most important is to look and see photographically. You look at something, I'm out in the world photographing, and then it's like, well, how, how can I interpret this? You know, Because there's a very big difference between something that is picturesque and something that is photogenic. Very big difference between the two. And so learning how to see like your lenses, learning how to see like your sensor, learning how to interpret color and light, um, being fast with your camera. One of the basic differences between me and most of you out there is I photograph all the time. I'm fast. I'm, you know, and I've been doing it for a, a long time. So when I see a, a scene, I, um, um, sometimes I go, oh, yes, literally I could go inside this and photograph them um, lighting the candles. But was I was going, wow, this is a really dirty window. And look what it's doing to the color. Um, if this is really a picture about color and pattern. And of course, I needed to find the subjects in the back that were separated along with the, the little lights in itself. So remember, straight on, maybe not. Sometimes it works. Move. Think about getting low. Think about high. Move around your subject. Eliminate everything that doesn't matter. Find the problems and solve them if you can, you know. Sometimes moving an inch can solve a really big problem. And that's the basic, you know, it's not that hard to become a good photographer. You can become a very good photographer, but getting up into that virtuoso of seeing. And of course, there is no Everest to creativity. There's, you know, it's, it's forever. That's why I love photography, because it's hard. And there's always a problem, and I'm always, I'm solving them. See the skeleton of the light. Is the contrast working with you? Skeleton of light is easy in low contrast, but in high contrast, you need to look at it. And then... Pay attention to the color and don't photograph despite the contrast. Oh, this is the most fantastic person in the world. Create an image that works because of the contrast or try something else. OK, learn the color wheel. And look, there are many more uh, really study these contrasts of colors. I only talked about a few of them, um, but there's many, many more to understand the uh, contrast of proportion and so forth. Um, contrasting colors next to each other, um, different, you know, saturations and hues. All of that's very important. Look for the peak moment of gestures. 
really try to add that one more thing. You've got a good frame, but can you add one more thing? One more person in the background. Open it up, maybe add a building that gives you a definition and a sense of place. Consider using selective focus, layers, slow shutter speeds, panning, and on camera flash. And so remember, color, light, action pattern. You don't have to have all four, but you need at least two. And I love this quote, creativity can solve almost any problem. The creative act, the defeat of habit by originality overcomes everything. So remember my last name is W-I-E-R.com. You know, follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And um, thank you so much. I think I made it. I made it to an hour. <laughs> you did it. Now we're going to go over a little bit because we have a few questions and I've got, okay. I got to tell you, <clears throat> I'm old and I've been in this business a long time. I've seen a bunch of webinars. I've seen a bunch of people talk about color. I've never seen anybody do it better than you just did it. Oh, so I, 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 I'm very sincere in that. I'm not just blowing smoke. I really mean it. Uh, the way you taught us about how to use color and still use our creativity. So I just wrote down a few things that I want to say okay. out loud. Uh, you said, photography is about feeling. So I, I have so many people in my career have come to me and said, what kind of camera and what kind of flash and what kind of this and what kind of that. Photography is about feeling because photography is a split second or a second, usually at most in time frozen. And so it really is about feeling, being patient, waiting. This, this, I used to shoot four by five and this is where I learned how to be patient and wait. It, it cost me this much money to shoot a piece of film and then process it. I've got to really be sure I've got it. So that's one thing I think we've lost some of with digital photography. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now you are a Calibrite ambassador. And the reason you're a Calibrite ambassador is because not only are you a fabulous photographer, but you understand how important color control is to being able to getting your vision uh, to where it is. So it, tell us a little bit about how I, I want to two things when you're editing, you're telling me that you're using uh, a burst. So you've got to edit out a lot of images, mm. right? So mm -hmm. editing becomes very important and, and color and what you see on your monitor is obviously of ultimate impact. So just say a few words about those two things. Well, you know, I, I think, um, calibrating monitors. I mean, one of the reasons why Mac kind of took over early on, right, was because it was it was uh, adhering to the ICC, the International Color Consortium. And I really understood that immediately. And of course, um, oh, how long have, uh, you know, software been out? It hasn't been that long. How many years has it been? Like 15 years, do you think, Brenda, something like so, that? Uh, you mean the x right products? Yeah. When yeah. Did they first so I've been out? I've been working with them for at least 20 years. 20 so, years. Yeah. yeah. So I was from the very beginning. I've always believed in, um, you know, and I, I really see color very intensely. I don't know. I'd love to think I'm one to two percent of women that see more color. But there, there's no way of knowing. But color is very important to me. I really differentiate it. And I, I'm very careful also about, I don't sit, um, you know, my, the, my grays. That's why this room is gray, because other colors will interfere um, uh, with it. So I need it to be really impeccable. So I, I my monitors that I use, um, the brand name, there's a lot of good monitors out there. Right? I have ISO and NEC and, you know, there, there's a uh, ViewSonic. There's many, many um, good ones, um, but they really need to be calibrated. And that's important. Now, for me, since I'm not a studio photographer, um, my light's not steady. You know, it's constantly changing. Uh, I like to work on daylight white balance because I don't want... Um, like the color of fog. I don't want everything to be neutralized. I, I want to know what the color of the light is because we psychologically filter out color when we look at the world. So when I'm looking at rain and fog or I go into a building, I want to, is there green in that? Is there yellow in that? You know, I'm looking at the lights. I, I turn off that psychological filter and I go, what is the color that I'm seeing? Because I think that that's so important. So of course, all, all of my, uh, when I'm editing and editing, I mean, choosing images and then processing, raw processing is a whole nother thing. 
course, that that's become explosively, yeah. you know, dynamically good. But bless you for having these brilliant, um, especially your new product. Oh, my God. It's so great for um, profiling this new Mac M2 yeah. I have. I'm, I'm yeah. thrilled about it. But tell me a little bit about editing. Now, when you're when you're doing these bursts, you go through and you pick the image or images and then do you just get rid of the others or do you, yeah. do, yeah. do they become your children and you save them? No, no, no. I would never. I mean, I have this huge, you know, uh, huge, huge hard drives over here. I love to, even with slides. I love flinging them into the, if it wasn't right in the frame, it was like, boom, into the trash can. Okay, good. The trash can. Right. It's yeah. cathartic. And so when I go through and edit, which means choosing images, um, I use reject in Lightroom and I'm like, no, no, I, yeah. I hate everything. No, yeah. no, 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 no. And I might go through those no's and say, well, maybe. Then I get to, like, then I go, okay, now one stars. And then I filter to the one stars. And I go, okay, now one stars. Then I go two stars. Yeah, filter to that. Then three stars is about as far as I get, you know. And then, and, you know, uh, if I have a four star, it means I've, I've processed it. Um, I leave five stars for that elusive you know, um, Everest that I saw those Pulitzer Prize winning ones. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah they're All very right. elusive. Now but we've got, a few, we got a few questions <laughs> here. Uh, so a couple of them have to do with that. This is a really excellent question. I'm going to ask you several questions that are related. How do you find the courage to take pictures of people? What are some of the reactions that you get? Do you at times have to take a long time to capture the perfect shot? And I think you've answered that. And do you use or uh, do, what about model releases? Is this is this an issue? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that one real quickly. Model releases. Well, I don't. Stock photography used to be a big part of the pie of my income. It's not anymore. And I used to go to great lengths to get model releases and thumbprints and things like that. But you know, since most of my work is editorial, um, I, I don't go to that trouble. It's very liberating now because I'm not working in stock photography. Um, and I know it's the world becomes more and more litigious. But most of my images now I'm using for personal projects and exhibits, which so it's it's less of an issue for me, thank goodness. But uh, in terms of photographing people, now, again, something, a topic I could talk long, and some of you have heard me talk about it for many, many hours. I'll just say this one thing. Most of po photographing people is not about the other person. Sometimes it is. Sometimes they're in a bad mood. They, they have a, had a bad encounter with another photographer. Their mother died. Their business isn't going well. Uh, whatever, you know, um, they're busy. Uh, it, most of the time, photographing people is about me. It's, it's I have found 90% of the people in the world like to be photographed. But it's how I approach people, how honest I am. And I can't generalize too much because there are some cultures where I've been in cultures where I've sat down for hours and just talked to them before I brought out a camera. Other cultures like India and some other places um, are just so easy. You, you know, it's just it's just me sort of saying, I, you know, I'm interested in what's beautiful in the world. I'm not a social I'm not photographing the crack dens and the social problems. I'm not a war photographer. That's a whole nother thing of building trust. But I do work a lot with ethnic tribal groups. And so sometimes that trust comes slower. Sometimes it takes a day. Sometimes it's taken some multiple trips, depending on the assignment I have. But honestly, if, if you think, if you have a projection in your head, oh, that person doesn't like me. Oh, I'm going to have to pay them. You know, believe me. I know all the reasons not to photograph. I, my shoes hurt. I haven't had a cup of coffee. I'm tired. But you have to let all of that go. And I approach each person as an individual. And I'm looking for someone I synchronize with. I can't become, you know, uh, Indian or uh, Sri Lankan, you know, but I can try to get in the same rhythm of them and maybe know a few words. And But it's really about nonverbal communication and approaching people honestly. And, and But how do, how do you handle the, the, the expectation of them being paid? Do you uh, well? The first of all, most people don't. Most people don't ask to be paid. All it's right. what it's in your head, you know. Okay. And usually, it's a little kid that's coming up to you, like putting out their hands, and I just slap them or shake them. I mean, I mean, there are situations where you're asking someone to be a model. Absolutely. Yeah. There are some uh, ethnic groups where there is no question, you know, you go to the OMO, you are going to pay those people. So, yes, you go to the Taos Pueblo, you got to pay to get in, you know. Um, 
Definitely. And sometimes, yes, if someone starts to give me that sign, I give people a lot of chance to say no. I can tell you, all I have to do is raise my camera just a little bit, not even to my eye. And I can tell whether someone's, if someone looks down, they look away, like they're going to get up or their hand comes out, my camera goes down. And now it's not about the camera. Doesn't mean I go away. Depends on the situation. But I, I think most people just project that, oh, I'm going to have to pay them. And that. Uh -huh. Projection just is, is a killer. It just kills you. Okay, good. So a uh, couple of practical questions. Uh, do you use image stabilization for your low shutter speeds? Um, yes, I have my cameras on image stabilization all the time. And I know even on panning, they have the one and two um, settings for a horse. And most of the time I forget to change it. And does the way I'm panning, I, I, I think, you know, way I'm panning, there's no image stabilizations that's going to counteract, you know, that. So um, not too worried about that so much. Um, but I, I love image stabilization it has you know, really changed the world. I think um, auto yeah. the way how quick autofocus changed. Image, I mean, so many great changes. Yeah, I, I tell everybody all the time. This is uh, I've been taking pictures since I was nine years old, and I'm now 66, soon to be 67. And this is the golden age of photography. I've mm -hmm. lived through everything before there was even RC paper in black and white. And this is the golden age for sure. It, it is. And everyone's photographing. And again, there's nothing. I have friends who are fantastic iPhone photographers. I'm not fast enough with an iPhone. I, I, I miss things with an iPhone. And there's things I can't do like the flash and so on. But for a lot of photographers who don't work in these quick moving situations like I do, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, you just need to know how to use whatever tool you have and how to use it and, and to push the limits of creativity of it. Yeah. One of the questions we had is really in, interesting insofar as it says, you know, have you learned about looking and seeing photographically with a smartphone camera? And I know for myself, uh, I'm still learning about composition. I'm a, I'm a tactician. I'm a technical person. Mm -hmm. I'm not a great photographer. So I still am at this age trying to learn how to see. And the iPhone has really helped me with that because mm -hmm. I can literally, you know, frame it up like you mm -hmm. used to do like this. <laughs> Yeah. And for situations, um, especially when you're first starting out that aren't moving that quickly, you can get it really, really clear. But again, I find most people just sort of go, oh, interesting subject. And they don't take the time to go, That's oh, right. maybe I should go down here. Maybe I, should go. I mean, the really good iPhone photographers, you watch them, they're like down low. They're not standing way far back and going, they're right up there. They're using the mobility of an iPhone. Like the way, same way I feel about my mirrorless camera with the flip out screen. I think it's a game changer. Mobility of getting all these different physical perspectives are fantastic. And it's with you. So, yes, your your pattern, your composition is your foundation of your uh, of your image. And you can use color with it. You can use great light with it. You can get great action with it. There's just some limitations. You can't do some of the things I was talking about. There's apps that you can use for um, selective focus. There's lenses that are out there. Um, I have no problem with it, but I'm, I still really just love my camera. Do, do you mainly, uh, what do you process in mostly Lightroom? Lightroom. And um, when I'm printing, uh, when I do an exhibition, printing to me, making a print is like making a sculpture. So uh, burning, the burning and dodging, which is, I think is one of the most critical things. And most of my um, uh, exhibits now are in infrared. I, I work in layers in Photoshop, but Lightroom, I mean, I haven't even learned the new features that just came out. It's, it's, it's becoming so robust and being able to work with the adjust, with the adjustment tools and um, also in layers now is is a big boon but yeah it's, it's amazing and i've worked with it from the inception and uh, it's it's just only getting better and we noticed that you saw you used a lot of different cameras a lot of different lenses and i think i think i know what you're going to say is the best camera is the one that you have in your hand right of course mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah and i and i usually if and i know the next question is well what now what lenses do i take well i have two cameras one is for visible light and one is for infrared light okay the infrared light uh just has one lens on it because it works really well without um having any uh issues with flares and so on 24 to 105 f4 but i carry with me a wide angle 16 to 35 a 24 to 7 70, and depending on the situation, either, either a 70 to 200, 2.8, or the 100 to 500. And okay. um, I, th those are my three main, and I always have my flash in my camera bag. 
Yeah. Yeah. That was a very important piece for me too. Thank you for coming. Nevada, we just can't thank you enough. It was brilliant. So enjoyable. And I hope you'll come back again. Oh, you bet. I just love it. Thank you. I thank you so much. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.